this video, I'd like to discuss psychoanalytic criticism as a framework for understanding and analyzing different artifacts that we find in media and, and literature and different areas like that. So um, let's jump right in. Psychoanalytic criticism is grounded in the work of Sigmund Freud and his development of psychoanalysis. And uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about the, the, the framework of psychoanalysis. Now, I want to be clear, this is not a, a judgment on psychoanalysis. It's not a, an endorsement. Uh, nor is it, you know, trying to discard the, the validity of psychoanalysis. We're not going to get into that at all. We're simply looking at these are the tenets, not whether they're right or wrong or anything like that, but these are the tenets of psychoanalysis and then use that as a framework to lay over uh, different artifacts so that we can understand whether uh, there's something psychologically driving the creation of these artifacts and different things like that. So uh, again, we're not going to get into whether or not, you know, Freud had it right or wrong. We're just using his information here and his, the framework of psychoanalysis as a tool for analyzing um, different artifacts. So again, it's rooted in the, the theories of psychology and psychological development that were developed by Freud. So in order to understand what kind of uh, framework that establishes, we're going to take a look at Freud's work. So here's some just very basics uh, about, about Freudian um, theories on psychoanalysis. Um, first of all, he was, he was convinced that behavior is driven by the unconscious, that we are, that most of our behavior and our, and our uh, interactions and, and things are driven by things that we don't consciously think about. That they're not at the forefront of our mind. They're driven by, uh, you know, these things that we don't even uh, realize are happening. So, and that these are largely developed by childhood events. And he goes through a series of different um, things that influence these things. But two of the major ones uh, are first our relationships with our parents. And if you know anything about Freud, you may know that he, he uh, really leaned into this, the idea of the complicated relationship between a child and, and their mother um, for both, you know, boys and girls when they're younger, that, 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 that relationship with their mother is what's paramount and that they're in conflict constantly with the mother's attention uh, with the, the other kids and with the father and different things like that. So that, that those relationships are, uh, are where a lot of this internal conflict comes from for us. Uh, then also he goes through some different series of um, physiological fixations, to put it kindly. Uh, he says that we are at different times kind of obsessed and driven by the need to satisfy different fixations that we have, starting with an oral fixation. For example, you know, babies are constantly putting things in their mouth. They're, they're sucking on their fingers and a pacifier or whatever that, that, that we have that kind of oral fixation. Um, then he goes through different physiological logical areas, including, including, you know, sexual, uh, sexual organs and, and, uh, reproductive organs that, uh, that we become fixated with and that can really kind of have a major impact according to Freud, major impact when our ability to satisfy one of those physiological fixations is interrupted or we are for whatever reason, not able to satisfy those physiological fixations that that will stick with us and be a part of, you know, some conflict that we have, um, some, kind of unsatiated need from childhood um, based on that. So uh, lots of different things that, that he talked about. Those are two of the key ones, but, but really the core here is that, that a lot of these subconscious behaviors that, that we develop are, stem from our childhood and something that happened in our childhood um, and has a significant kind of carryover into adulthood. Uh, Freud also said that we, we develop defenses that are created to keep these conflicts buried. Okay, that, that we, we we find ways to keep them pushed down so that they are not at the forefront, so that they remain in the subconscious or unconscious, uh, that and and remain hidden from the conscious, and so we're not fully aware of how these are influencing us. Uh, some of the different things, and this is just a handful of the things that he mentioned, are some of the different defenses that may be familiar to us are um, uh, selective memory that we that we choose to remember certain things, or or that we put a different spin on things in our in our adulthood. That the way things happen as a child that they may not have happened that way, but, or, but we just choose to remember certain things and not remember others. Then we have this selective perception that we choose to see certain things and not see other things uh, based on what's going to be less harmful to our psyche in a sense. Um, we, the, we rely on denial uh, and, and on projection, projecting our, uh, you know, issues on other people and things. And then various fears, uh, maybe a fear of uh, intimacy or a fear of death or whatever, but these various fears um, that, that we that we try to keep 
um, buried. So we, so we developed these defenses in order to do so. And we developed, you know, fear of intimacy so that we won't uh, be in danger of, uh, of being abandoned again or being, you know, feeling left out or whatever. So, so we just choose not to get involved because of, of that, you know, kind of proactively, so to speak, would be one of his uh, ideas in terms of why we develop these defenses in order to keep these conflicts buried. So, okay. So our behavior is driven by our unconscious. It's, it stems from a lot of stuff that happens in our childhood in various ways, and that we develop these defenses to keep those conflicts buried so that we don't actually have to deal with them, right? So then there are these three areas as a result that vie for dominance within us, right? That we are constant, that are constantly engaged in, in battle themselves and engaged in conflict. And, and these three things he called the id, the ego, and the superego. And just in a, in a very broad sense, the id is where he says that the location of these drives is at. It's what, it's what's driving us. It's our need for instant gratification. The id wants to be satisfied right now. Okay. The, the super ego to jump, jump on, and on the other side of things and leapfrog over ego for just a second. The super ego is where our, you know, our, our, is the location of our judgment. It's our moral compass. It's what, you know, it's what we, it's our beliefs and values and things like that, that says, you know, we can do this and we can't do that. And it's also where we house those things that's influenced by our society and by our culture in terms of what's right and wrong and what's, uh, you know, what we can do and what we can't do. So, uh, the super egos were that so that you can see the id and the super ego are really at conflict with one another then the ego is the location of these defenses that we talked about first of all it's where we keep everything down but it's it's the middleman there it's the kind of you know it's the arbitrator between the id and the super ego it's it's what's trying to satisfy both of those things um probably unsuccessfully since they're they're diametrically opposed but the ego is then caught in the middle so you can think of it in a sense in cartoons. We see this a lot of times, right? We have the, a cartoon character will have the angel on one shoulder and the, and the little devil on the other shoulder. So the, the angel would be our super ego telling us this is what's right. This is what's moral. This is what we should be doing. This is what a good person would do and, and a, you know, a just person would do. And then on the other shoulder, we got the little devil, which is our id saying, no, I want this now. I really want this. And, and you want this. And so we let's do it. Let's just, you know, why shouldn't we do it? Why sh let's have that gratification right now. And then the ego is in the middle, right? The ego is caught in the middle. So if you are a Simpsons fan, I mean, if you know this from the Simpsons, you're a Simpsons fan. This is, just, this is portrayed very well in the characters of the Simpsons, you know, where Bart is the id, Lisa is the super ego, and Homer is caught in the middle. So Bart, we know, is all about what do I want now? Let's just do it. Let's not think about it. This is what I want. So why shouldn't I have it? And why shouldn't I do it? So Bart's all about the id. Lisa, on the other hand, is always in her head. She's always saying, well, that's not fair. That's not right. Even though I want this, I can't do this because it's going to affect other people. And it's going to, you know, so forth. So she's the super ego on, on the other extreme end of that spectrum. And Homer, we know, is caught in the middle. He's constantly torn by what he wants, whether it's, a, you know, whether it's a donut or whether it's what, whatever it is that, that he wants in that particular moment. He's drawn, you know, almost inexorably toward it. Uh, but at the same time, he's got this kind of moral compass where he's saying, gosh, I shouldn't have that or I shouldn't. It's going to hurt somebody. It's going to, you know, but but I really want to. And so he's kind of caught in the middle. We see Homer as the ego then uh, in The Simpsons, if you care to picture it that way. But Freud said that all of these things are influencing us. These three areas are constantly vying for dominance within us. And, and so we have this conflict, not necessarily, again, not consciously. We're not super aware of this. Uh, but w within us, these, these battles are going on at all times anyway. And so finally, he said then that all of this influences our adult behaviors. And it all stems from childhood stuff, things that happen in our childhood where we're either allowed to develop or our development and it's at a certain stage or in a certain area is stunted in some way. And so we don't get past it. We become fixated on that and it becomes a major influence, but that all of these things then carry over into adulthood and subconsciously, unconsciously, they drive all of our behaviors that they, they, they dictate what we're going to do and, and uh, what our mindset's going to be on something and whether we, you know, again, not even consciously, not even something that we realize and actively think about, but they all influence us in a subconscious way, in an unconscious way. 
them. So those are the basics of Freud. And, and I mean basics, and that's just a quick overview and just to, to give us an idea of where we're coming at from this framework here. So um, now that we have that understanding, let's look at the major premises then of psychoanalytic criticism. Again, we're not concerned with whether or not Freud got it right or not, or whether it's, you know, valid as, as therapy. That's not, that's not our concern. Our concern is this is what's true about psychoanalysis, uh, according to Freud. And so this is how we're going to use this as a framework moving forward. So again, Freud says that, that our unconscious childhood com conflicts influence our adult behavior. So this, this conflicts are still there. The conflict, you know, the results in the, 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 uh, the, the battles between the id and the superego and, and putting the ego in the middle and all of that then influences our adult behaviors. That's, that's, that's the premise of psychoanalysis, right? So for our purposes, uh, we're going to say that all of that, that we just talked about shows through in what a person creates that their psychology will come through and be evident in their creation because they're going to be uh, unable to to stop it it's unconscious right we can't we can't stop what's coming through so that by looking at what they create we as examiners we as viewers can pull some insight um, based on that about that person about their their life and about their their values and so um, recognizing then the psychological attributes of the creator offers us as examiners insight into an artifact. So we can see, you know, if, if that person was influenced by their psychology when they created that thing, then we can see uh, how so and we can kind of pull, draw some conclusions about that person psychologically by examining this artifact and by what's coming through then. That's the premise. So some common questions that come up as a result of uh, psychoanalytic uh, criticism. Uh, first of all, how do the operations of a repression structure or inform the work? So the, the, these, these ideas of repression and conflict and things that weren't fully realized as a child and so forth, how does that come out? How does that inform the work? What can we tell about that person uh, from this work? Uh, what, what conclusions can we draw about their childhood and what they, they were able to receive and, and resolve and, and what they weren't? Uh, so how do the operations of that repression uh, structure or inform the work? What Oedipal or other family dynamics are present? Again, the Oedipus complex has to do with it. It's you know, based on the, the play by Shakespeare, Oedipus. Uh, so the, the character Oedipus from the Shakespeare work who is, uh, becomes obsessed with his mother, right? And, uh, and so Freud says, well, that's totally natural. He, he was in conflict, you know, as a child, he, all, all male children are in conflict, so to speak, with their father for their mother's attention and affection, and he didn't get that, so then he became obsessed with it. That's the Oedipus complex. So what Oedipal or other family dynamics, again, rooted in childhood are present? Here, and what, what conclusions can we draw about that person's childhood and what they did receive, what they didn't receive, what they were able to resolve and not resolve? How can characters' behavior, narrative events, and or images be explained uh, in terms of psychoanalytic concepts of any kind? So looking at any of these psychoanalytic uh, concepts, um, uh, what conclusions can we draw? So for example, um, fear or fascination with death. Uh, is there is there some something to be drawn from that? Is there is that evident in this work? Uh, is there something evident from uh, or related to sexuality, whether that's uh, love and uh, and romance or you know physical sexuality? Is there something you know really evidently present related to that? Uh, and if so, what does that um, tell us about that person's psychological identity? Um, or you know what conclusions can we draw about the the relationship between the id and the superego, and then as a result the ego uh, from this person? So uh, just you know using any of these different types of uh, psycho psychoanalytic concepts, is there is there something to be found there that we can that we can the standing out to us that this person is subconsciously uh, letting out through this work. A few more questions that we could look at. Um, what does the work suggest about the psychological being of the author? Just, just in general, who, who is this person psychologically? What does this tell us about this person? Um, what might a given in interpretation of an artifact suggest about the psychological motives of the examiner? So now we're flipping it around a little bit here. What does this interpretation tell us about us? Okay, because this person had work, you know, their, their, their psychoanalysis or their psychology comes through in that work, but our psychology also can come through in our examination. So what does this interpretation, what does the, the analysis, the interpretation that we develop say about us, say about the psychology, psychological motives of us as an examiner? 
are there prominent words in the piece that uh, that could have different or hidden meanings and, and words being you know, if this is a piece of literature or something um, verbal like that um, but if it's a work of art what, what's prominent in this in this work in this artifact um, and does that have a different or hidden meaning to it and uh, if so could there be a subconscious reason that the author is using these problem words or these significant words? Is there something subconscious there that, that leads the person to, to say those things? You know, sometimes we might refer to that as a Freudian slip, right? Um, so uh, so uh, we want to understand, is there a reason that these particular words are showing up? And does that tell us something about the psychology of this individual as well? So I want to, as I've done before, I want to work through an artifact with you and just examine something. And uh, so I just picked something that came up for us this week. From, and by us, I mean my wife and I. We were watching a popular, uh, one of those popular uh, music competition shows, right? And people are singing. And and uh, so in this particular show, they had to pick a song. And they had to pick from a group of songs. And they were showing all these people go through. And, and there was, I mean, there were probably 50 people that went through. And, and uh, they didn't show all of them, of course. But it seemed like 90% of the people picked the same song. And I ended up, it was nonsense to me. I'm not familiar with this song. And I said to my wife, what is this? Are they, are they just making this up? Is this just random words that they're throwing together or what? So I should admit that I had a little preconceived notion of, of, of this song before, or, or some judgment about this song before I ever even heard the actual song or saw the video. And I ended up watching the video because I said, but what is this nonsense that all these people are picking? It's obviously popular. I'm so out of touch with popular music. I was a little more in touch when our kids were at home and we had to listen to it all the time in the car or whatever. Um, because I'm a generous dad like that and I let them listen to their stations. But now that they're gone, I don't listen to any of that stuff anymore. My, my radio has not been on pop music for uh, several years now. So anyway, so I picked this song and you're probably familiar with it. And I'm not familiar with, was not familiar with it. Uh, it's called Watermelon Sugar by Harry Styles. And, uh, and I don't know much about Harry Styles, to be honest. I mean, I, you know, I did a little, uh, background on him uh, for the purposes of, of recording this video, understand he was part of the, you know, popular group, uh, One Direction, now a solo artist and, and, uh, is very, is very popular and seems to be popular with the, the ladies as well. So, um, but this watermelon sugar, they just can't, I mean, this, this, when I heard these people singing the song over and over and over again and singing the chorus, I'm just like, what is, this is ridiculous. What? What does this even mean? So I decided I'll pick this for my analysis. So I'm going to do a psychoanalytic criticism. And again, in the most shallow sense of the word criticism, because I'm just trying to rush through this to give you an idea of what this might look like. We're going to do this for watermelon sugar. Are you ready? Same questions we just looked at for watermelon sugar. We're going to look at now. So how do the operations of repression structure or inform this work? Well, um, it's very clear from the video and, and then from the, the, the light research that I did on this, that this song has, uh, is very much grounded in sexuality. So uh, I'm sensing some sense of repression in terms of sexuality and, and, uh, from his childhood, you know, if we're, if we're going according to Freud's, uh, concept of psychoanalysis that he had some sort of repression that happened in his childhood related to sexuality and is now uh, is probably subconsciously trying to let that out in a in a more uh, obscure way right he's using a euphemism uh, for for sexuality in a particular uh, maybe or may or may not be a particular you know sexual act that he's referring to but he's using it euphemistically both because he probably can't say this what he wants to say and still have the radio still have it be released on radio and so forth but presumably because you know if it was that important to him just say it then he would but presumably he's got some issue with just you know referring to that and admitting to it and saying it and having that be a part of the song so he's found a way to euphemistically refer to this sexual act or this is you know or this sense of intimacy um depending on your interpretation of the song uh, whether it's just about touch and physical contact or whether it's about something in particular uh, but seems to imply some sort of repression of of uh, based in uh, in sexuality yeah. uh, what uh, oedipal or family dynamics are present again you know I don't know if I see a particular family dynamic represented here so much as just a general repression of sexuality. Uh, I would presume that uh, that maybe sex sex was not a topic common to his uh, to his home, and now he's trying to uh, express that a little more in his in his art and in his work right? uh, in a way that he can, though still again euphemistically without really uh, coming straight out and saying what he's talking about. So can, how can a character's behavior, narrative events, or images be explained in terms of psychoanalytic concepts of any kind? 
So again, I would come back to to sexuality and, and really almost the the operations of you know, id, super ego, and ego. Um, is id is telling him, "I want this. I want this physical contact. I want this." And maybe even this person in particular. There's some um, question about whether this this song is about a particular person that he was involved with, and then that relationship ended. So maybe it's it's an expression of the id of either I want this sexually gratifying act, or I want this person back in my life. Um, but a super ego is saying, you can't just say that you can't just, you know, start flaunting this as, as openly as you would like. So, so we got to find some way to couch that. And the ego is saying, okay, let's talk about it. Let's, let's put it out there, but let's, let's couch it in this euphemism of watermelon sugar and the, and the imagery that goes along with that. And, uh, and, and make it very clear what we're talking about without actually having to say it. Right, we're going to imply uh, what we're getting at here without actually saying it. So you could kind of uh, lay that over the, the the whole id versus super, super ego and and being then negotiated by the um, by the ego and, uh, and and some of those different fears that he made and some of the different um, things that he may be expressing in that way. What's the work suggest about the psychological being of the author? Um, uh, my my again my you know. Um, armchair expert, so to speak, uh, view of this uh, would be uh, coming back to sexuality that he's that he's exploring some of this and uh, but not really comfortable um, coming right out and, and expressing it either comfortable expressing his desire for um, for this particular uh, act or this particular person uh, if, if this song is you know, again, again connected to this particular person that he was involved with um, that uh, that uh, my guess is again that he had some repression related to sexuality when he was a child and is now uh, enacting that uh, as a, as an adult and letting it come out a little more uh, and, and probably some sense of um, inadequacy in a sense that he's that he's feeling the need to focus on this and flaunt this that he's feeling inadequate in other ways and maybe saying look i'm good at this stuff i'm good at you know i i know what i'm doing with physical touch and i know what i'm doing so despite my inadequacies in some other areas maybe he's lacking confidence in in other areas um that uh, but but i have confidence in this so he's gonna put it on display and um, that that could be a part of it as well uh, what's a given interpretation of an artifact suggest about the psychological motives of the examiner um you know i don't know that's that's a good question what are my psychological motives here um um, I guess my main motive is to to really focus on how shallow this song is. This is one of the songs that my kids would have hated when we were growing up, especially my daughter, because we would have been driving along. She would have sung every word of the song. And then I would have asked her, what does that mean? What's the song about? And she would have said, as she constantly did, I don't know. I just like the song. I just listened to it. So I would say, you just listen to this entire song, saying every word, and you don't know what you're singing about. You don't know. What, and, and I believe her. she wouldn't have thought about that necessarily. But, um, but for me, it, gets to what's the purpose of this song i mean my psychological motives here are digging a little deeper i think and, and you know uh, so that that was the only conclusion that i could draw you know, in this brief time here uh, is for me that i'm looking for something a little deeper i'm looking to be critical of this person i don't know maybe i'm jealous of his success maybe i'm jealous of uh, I, I don't know of his looks of his youth or whatever that that's all possible according to freud that that i would be um, jealous of all those types of things but uh, anyway uh, are there prominent words in the piece that could have different or hidden meanings? Uh, yeah, yeah. I think I think the title of the song, yeah, absolutely, and the, and the imagery in the video certainly uh, referring to hidden meanings. Again, at the very least, about physical contact, about about you know probably sexual contact, and maybe more specifically, depending on your interpretation of the song, but. Yeah, absolutely. There, there are words there that don't mean what they mean. That that are implying different things, and and the, the imagery of the video certainly backs that up. And is there a subconscious reason for the author using these words? Again, maybe it's that it's just, maybe it's just about radio play because he can't just say the things he wants to say and is referring to in the songs, and have it played on the the radio, popular radio. Uh, but there could be something deeper there too about you know he's not comfortable saying the actual words and and uh, or or expressing those actual ideas or or talking about who it's actually about, uh, and so he he represses that in a sense that uh, that, um, that he finds other words to euphemistically refer to those things. So. Okay, hopefully this again gives you an idea of what we're looking at here with psychoanalytic uh, criticism. We, we talked about the foundations of this. I tried to give you some common questions and then walk you through uh, a really 
you know, rough, quick uh, analysis of a particular artifact. So uh, again, I would encourage you to get into some deeper thought about these things and really dig deep uh, as you as you consider um, the psychoanalytic framework for criticism. If you have any questions, feel free to email me. I'm always happy to, to communicate and, and uh, collaborate with people via email and answer any questions you might have about this or anything else related to media and literary criticism. Uh, in the meantime, get out there. Think about Freud. You can apply it to yourself. You can apply it to other people. Uh, again, not, not endorsing or discarding his theories, but just saying use it as a way to dig deeper into these artifacts and to really consider who it is and what they're, what's coming through in their creation.